Good morning, everyone. Thank you for dragging yourselves here at such an astronomically early hour of the morning and, of course, tearing yourself away from Sky One's uh, programming policy for the next year, which I think is going on somewhere next door. Um, panel that needs very little introduction, and as Eric Schmidt said last night, you can always Google them if I don't give you enough information. Miranda Hart, the funniest woman in Britain. <laughs> Sarah Hadland. <laughs> and Mark Freeman, the head of comedy at the BBC. Miranda, I thought we should probably start with you. That's the custom. Right. And um, if you could sort of fill us in briefly on the whirlwind 20-year slog that's brought <laughs> yeah. you to yeah. this moment here, uh, a kind of yeah, potted 15, history. 15 years, yeah. So it's very weird for me being back at the Edinburgh Festival, being on this side of the... Uh, being at the TV Festival. I, I did my You're not knocking on the door yeah, trying to get yeah, in. Yeah, Mark Freeland, head of comedy, knows who I am. My <laughs> God. Uh, it's Let's very see. surreal, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I did my first Edinburgh in 94 and then uh, I sort of did it every year and then 2001 I got my first telly job. I did a couple of um, sketches in Smack the Pony but I didn't give up temping until 2005, 2006. I did my last Edinburgh in 2005. What, what precipitated you giving up temping? I got a, a part in a, a sci-fi sitcom called Hyperdrive and I was a sort of the main woman in it so that was sort of my kind of biggest break I suppose. It can hardly be the um, career that your parents were dreaming of when they lavished uh, huge amounts of their, <laughs> their hard-earned money to send you to Down House, can yeah. it? It was a sort of breeding ground for future duchesses of Cambridge and, <laughs> and so on. So uh, at what point did, did comedy and, and I suppose acting, was it acting or comedy that, that, that first of all um, uh, appealed? Comedy really, yeah. I, um, I, just, I just remember sit watching Eric Morecambe when I was sort of six or seven and you know, doing his glasses thing down the lens to me in my sitting room. And I don't know why, but for some reason I went, that's what I want to do. And I didn't admit it till I was about 26. Um, for fear of? For, for, for fear of, um, yeah, the parents saying, what? Uh, which they did do, which uh, fueled me. <laughs> so it backfired. But yeah, my mother, I used to be a PA for eight years on and off whilst I was going to Edinburgh and um, doing gigs in London. And um, uh, my mum used to send me things from creme de la creme, you know, in the, in the Times or the Evening Standard about PAs going, oh, look, I love my job. So you see, being a PA is an excellent job. You stick with that. And, um, but that just, yeah, was fuel to fire, kept going. And, and do you think, do you attribute it at all? <coughs> that your, your father had a sort of seminal moment in his career when he was uh, commanding a ship in the, in the Falklands War and, and was sort of sent off to be kind of bait for the Argentine yeah. forces and lost 19 men. And it was a very traumatic thing. I don't think he talked about it for sort of 20 years no, after, 20 years, uh, after he yeah. came back. Did that in any way shape a, a, a kind of sense in you that you, that, you want, that you needed the attention of audiences to kind of make you feel? No, no, sorry to... Go, go to, on, just a little bit. To not make good <laughs> coffee there. But, um, yeah, Eric Morecambe. Done. No, no, it didn't actually. I mean, I was 10 when the Falklands happened and I, I do remember sort of getting back from school one day and there being a whole mass of press outside the house and having to go via the neighbours and mum told us. But apparently I said... Um, she said, you know, and we don't know whether he's dead or alive yet. And I said, oh, this is all very sad. Can I have a flapjack? So, um, <laughs> so your priorities Nothing's to change. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it didn't really have a, a big effect that I'm conscious anyway. But, uh, yeah, I just, I just sort of, uh, from a very early age, sort of loved comedy and, and thought it really important. You mentioned that you spent a lot of years coming up to Edinburgh and, and doing your shows. Is it something that you sort of resent now? Why did I have to put in all that incredible graft? Or, or do you see it very much as having shaped a lot of what's now become a Miranda? Yeah, I think two or three years off, off the process would have been nice. <laughs> so I ended up having my series on the telly when I was exhausted. So, um, but uh, no, I, I wouldn't want it any other way, actually, because it, it really took me that long to hone the persona. And I don't think any earlier I would have would have found the character a character strong enough to put in a sitcom uh, it really took me that long to develop as a person and and to find exactly what I wanted to do comedically so it was incredibly useful why do you think it took so long well I don't know I suppose some people in their 20s are, are confident to know what they want and know what they can do I mean I wasn't one of those people and uh, I started out doing sketches and thinking oh, I want to you know just be a character comedy actress and on, I would, couldn't have imagined then that I would ever be able to do stand-up. And then um, <clears throat> I did a double act for a bit, and I started, you know, sort of riffing with the audience and wanted to be sort of a version of me more. 
so then I started doing my own things and, and becoming this sort of, yeah, version of myself, like a stand-up, really. And, and, and the stand-up, as uh, uh, you said in the past, actually informs a lot of the, the way in which you write the show. I mean, you see that each segment could work as a sort of stand-up piece. That's part of the discipline of it, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I, I think <coughs> the stand-up brain, the way I've written stand-up in the past, is yeah, how I start with the ideas for the sitcom. Right, because it's a it's an unusual show and that it it's not a usual uh, ensemble cast where you get stuff from the sitcom or the good people. It really is predominantly about the one person and and uh, it could kind of be about anything. Um, universal theme. So so what, what stand ups write about? If that makes sense. You've been described as the reincarnation of Tommy Cooper, uh, Eric. <laughs> yes, you have. I could give it's you a, a few freaky. other choice ones. <laughs> um, you know, Eric Morecambe, I know, is, a, is an idol. Uh, you're sort of unashamedly retro in a way, aren't you? Yeah, well, I, I, I always knew... I mean, when I, a producer said, do you want to develop something? I said yes. And I thought, well, I might as well go for my pipe dream. And I said I'd love to do a sitcom that's also sort of liked entertainment in its format and I looked to camera and, and lets us fully embrace the studio sitcom genre um, because I think people were sort of at that stage sort of slightly looking down on it and there was, it was all about single camera sitcoms at that time. So I said, well, let's not be afraid to go, the studio sitcom is what it is and let's do you've been watching, I'll look to camera and just the performances will be quite heightened and surreal but hopefully better than enough reality for people to sort of go with them. So, yeah, I just wanted to embrace that 70s feel that I love so much. Were people sceptical at first? Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember my producer... How did, how did that manifest itself? Well, the producer was great. She just went, I think you're mad, you know, it's really risky. She said, I'll, I'll, she was brilliant. She said, I'll support you if that's really what you want to do. But it'd be much safer, you're much more likely to get it on if you do a sketch show or a, more of a, you know, simple setup of a sitcom. But um, she was great and said, OK, you, why don't you write it? I'll, I'll commission you to write with a script. And we'll go from there. Mark, someone comes to you with a, with, a, with a sitcom and they go, it's got no edge, no grit, no meanness, which I think is, is how one of the reviewers <laughs> described a Miranda's show. Surely your instant reaction would be, that's not for me. No, it's, it's quite the opposite, to be honest. Because I think in that era, about five years ago, three, four years ago, you know, still the the, um, the shadow of um, uh, single camera, The Office, uh, Lead Balloon, all those kind of shows was very heavy. And actually, what people like me want, and Cheryl Taylor out there, is studio sitcom. It's still seen as the as the summit. It really is because um, whether it's single camera or studio, there's something about a studio that's very theatrical, and it um, it's a big night out. It's a good night out, and ultimately. If you feel better after 29 minutes, having watched something, that's a good thing. And you know, I believe in, in that, and, and you're seeing a bit of a renaissance in it now. And sitcom, sitcom never died, you know, Black Books was around, um, Coupling was around. These, um, if you stayed up late enough. Yeah. But this is the magic, this is the magic of getting Miranda pre-Watershed. That, that was well, that was Well, when I did start developing it, uh, I wasn't, they said, no, you must, you must write a, a single camera. We don't, we're not looking for studios. And then in the two years it sort of took me to develop it, so there was then a shift. They said, no, you, are, you can do it as a studio now. I mean, that's the thing, it does change. This sort of seems to be kind of a, a fashion, which is why I said, you know, show no grit, no meanness, no edginess would have been an anathema, an absolute anathema. And when the BBC pronounces about the things it's looking for, it's, you know, cutting edge, diversity and so on, you don't often hear controllers go, what we want is a really nice middle-class girl <laughs> to do a I very sweet I mean, maybe and warm... It's a, um, uh, except my family, you know, highest rating comedy, never won any awards or anything like Miranda, but, you know, that, that was playing to nine, seven, eight, nine million people. So, in a way, it's let the people decide, and that was a, an amazing show, an amazing show. So, sit sitcom hasn't died, shouldn't die, will never die, and it's, I think it's the best, it's really... Female comedians on TV are about as rare as sightings of Gaddafi in the last 10 days. <laughs> um, why, why is that? And um, when clearly, you know, characters like Miranda and, and sort of before her, Catherine Tate and Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders and so on, have proved not just to be successful comedians, but sort of world-class mm. comedians. I think, well, I think there's, if you look at the fringe this year, I mean, it's, it's just the weight of mathematics. You know, it's, it is, it's, it's 75 percent men. I think, I think also that some of the big, the big uh, agencies are qu 
quite male, put it that way. So I think, I think male standouts get more of a push. The only comeback, I think, is that, that the list you mentioned, and add to that the Sharon Horgans, Julia Davis, Katie Brands, they, when they hit, they seem to shine even, even brighter. And of course, that's a wild generalization. But you know, the, 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 the excitement of Ab Fab, there are pictures all over the press. Yes, they've Ab Fab coming back. Uh, Catherine Tate, I mean, and Miranda and, and her cast, largely female cast, uh, I think they punch brighter when, when they happen. So does Victoria that mean that Wood, you're you know, actively it's... looking for female comedians? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was caught between doing this, which I'm very glad I'm doing, and being back at um, Television Centre doing Watson and Oliver, who, who in a, are a female duo who have the same essential story as um, Miranda, which is Edinburgh shows, and then a quite a long wait of honing and, and chucking stuff out and learning who they are before they, um, before they hit TV, and it was their first record last night. So, yes, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have been involved with Jocelyn G, Essien, and um, Catherine, and Julia Davis, Miranda. So when they, when they hit, I think that they're in, female comedy is very in, enduring. I mean, look at Dawn and... Like. But you described it as a very sort of male-led uh, arena. Is that something that the, the BBC can perhaps participate in changing by, by you know, in some way lending a, 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 a practice ground, as it were, for... for, for well, I hope, I mean, I hope, I hope we do. It's not just exclusively us, I hope we do. The, um, Channel 4 are doing a comedy lab with um, Anna Crilly and Katie Wick. So it's not just the BBC, but I think, I think honestly, the holy grail for us um, would be female icons, honestly. I'm not just saying that because I feel like a Tom Ellis stand in. I'm a bit with nervous us. with the yeah. girls, but, but that, you know, it's, it's, that, that's a holy grail for us. But let's talk about female icons then. You create a female icon. How do, how do you keep Miranda in a non competitive BBC? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a ripple of laughter from, I, I, I know who. Ooh, I, that was my producer, I know that laugh. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, um, you, you hope that the love of the show wins out, but I mean, there's no way you can stop the likes of Miranda um, progressing and doing other things. Um, I, so you have maybe, to be maybe a we lost, we, Maybe comedy lost someone like Catherine Tate a bit soon, put it that way. And it's always, you don't want to say breeding ground when you're talking about a female comedian, when you happily say it when you're talking about a male comedian. Um, let's talk a bit more about the comedy itself. I mean, it, it, it's very much that you are the butt of, of your own jokes, a human stagosaurus, I think you were described as by one critic. Do you have to develop a... a, 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 a <laughs> You have to develop a very... Do, do never read about yourself. No, I don't it's know. very healthy. Yeah, never Google. Sorry, Eric. Um, do, you, uh, do you have to develop a, a very hard shell, or in a way, is it a form of kind of protection to be the, the, the first person pointing out, you know, your idiosyncrasies? Yes, well, people have often said that the character's sort of too, too self-effacing or too put down, but, but actually I see it more of a sort of celebration of, of her, me, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, my, when we did the pilot, I think Sarah had some... I said I was off to shop at Big and Long, and you had some line about, don't you mean elephant and something? I can't yeah, remember what it the was. the audience went, ooh. ooh. And so I knew that that was then my rule for the series, that I would never get a sort of pity, oh, it has to be a laugh. So it can't be, it can't be too self-effacing. But, um, yeah, I, 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 see, I see the characters quite sort of celebratory of all her ridiculousness. But I think there's probably an elephant... I'm not going to you know, psychobabble, there's probably an element of me, you know, getting rid of a few things from my, <laughs> my 20s. I'm sure Just a few. Like, I mean, yeah, the, uh, the thing about being called Sir, which is in the f first episode, the first that, that's pr pretty much the one thing that, that happens to me in real life <laughs> that's true. And I've had a lot of letters from, from women who are uh, over six foot saying it happens to them as well and that's just been amazing for me to hear yeah. and go oh it's just it really is just the height thing because after a while you do get a bit like right this is <laughs> happening quite <laughs> quite regularly what the hell is is up with me but um I, I hasten to add when people sort of really look at me they don't carry on calling me sir <laughs> it's just a cursory, a cursory well, yeah. but then a, a lot of people apparently said um that uh, it's ridiculous as if, you know, a woman would ever get called Sir. So something from your real life is too sitcom to put in a sitcom, it turns out. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm very careful about not being too, yeah, not 
Oh, but there's a, there's, a, yeah. there's a great there's a great line in it sounds a bit GCSE. It was a great line I think earlier. That someone says to Miranda, um, "Just be yourself," and that, the, the reply is something yeah, like, "Yeah, we do it now." Um, just be <laughs> yourself, because yeah, that's <laughs> part of what we're supposed to be doing this morning. And, 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 and I think the answer is that's the most appalling idea An you've appalling had. Appalling piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's I think a, you know a huge thing, and that's why people come to it. You know, young and old is, is the feeling of, of saying, "Be yourself." <laughs> no. <laughs> Never. <laughs> But I think kind of everyone feels, I'm sort of trying to tap into the fact that I believe that everyone feels awkward. Mm. You know, everyone feels, a, a, you know, an idiot. And we're all trying to get through life and cover it up. And we, we, we do it to lesser or... <laughs> but it's interesting you're way. trying to avoid the pity thing. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, if you think of sort of series like Some Mothers Do Have Them and uh, other programmes that sort of poke fun at the, the main character, they did also rely on, on that sort of sense of pity. But it's something that you, you absolutely want to stand away yeah, from. Yeah, and I want to make sure it's funny, not not them feeling sorry for me. But, you know, equally, the character has, in one episode, in series two, three men after her. So, you Lucky know... a bitch. Yeah, the joy of writing <laughs> your own sitcom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in this episode, three men will find me very attractive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the worst moment, because it was Adrian Scarborough. Yeah. And that was one of the wor mo worst moments of my life. I had to potter down from the gallery and ask Adrian Scarborough, this fantastic actor, would you mind doing the next scene naked <laughs> with a helmet over your tackle? That's Bad a wrong, moment. wrong choice of the word, <laughs> helmet. <laughs> it's too early, sorry. Um, but he, it was the first time he'd yeah, taken he his kit off yeah. in 20 years. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd never, he said he'd, he'd, he'd do never it for done us. it before, but he'd only do it for the... You, you've said that you don't write for women, and I was quite surprised by that because, I mean, as a woman, and I'm sure many women's audience would agree, we, we love Miranda. Uh, and I wondered why you felt that you had to um, make that clear. I mean, there are plenty of male comedians who, who write for men, and if women want to go along for the ride, then, you know, yeah, they're welcome. Yeah, I suppose it sounds slightly anti feminist, doesn't it? But um, I suppose I didn't, I wanted to just make the, the themes and her sort of. Uh, wishes in life as universal as possible you know I just I just couldn't bear the thought of of uh, just women finding the show enjoying the show you know I, I, I knew invariably because I am a woman and because I write from that perspective that invariably it will be female skewed so therefore I wanted to make an effort to make it as as broad as possible so that it wasn't just to that way. Because it does also have the sort of elements, doesn't it, of like a, a, a good chick lit plot. You know, there's the, 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 the girl, the, 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 the love interest who doesn't really have a clue that she's interested at all, the scatty, batty, well, in fact, you're the opposite, uh, uh, best friend, the, the group of dysfunctional friends around them. W were those all elements that you were very conscious uh, about weaving into the, the, the sitcom? Um, what, what, as women, or just no, just as, as yeah, well, no, but as a sort of structure yeah. for for a comedy program. Yeah, I think I thought because uh, I knew that it was sort of my um, my sort of stand-up persona that was going to be the lead, and then so then I took a while to to work out, you know, who were the, who were going to be the people around her that would make her funnier and uh, make her life harder or better or. Um, yeah, and then and then find ways to make those those characters as funny as possible and as honed as possible. But um, yeah, now that might look like something that you just sort of went into the studio and had a good time with a, a few choice actors and actresses, and but it doesn't work like that with you, Miranda, does it? No, it's no. a hard slog from it's beginning hard, to end. There's hard. a draft, a bible, a graph, a yeah, my episode graph. <laughs> Yeah. Fill me in on those dark hours alone in your study. Yeah, well, I do, I do have a, a bit of help. The sort of, uh, when I've thought of enough ideas, I, I meet with two people who uh, help me storyline and sort of hone my ideas, and they spend about a month with me, and then I sort of go away and hone those and start writing, draft them for sort of four or five months. And then at the end of the process, I've got a couple of people who help me gag the script up. So predominantly, it's me, but I do get a bit of a help that I wouldn't be without either end. But uh, yeah, I've 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 always said this, and I, I think Mark and everyone keeps saying stop saying it. But uh, yeah, I do I do find it stressful. I put an enormous amount of pressure on myself um, with the scripts, and um, yeah, I don't I don't enjoy the process. But I, that's just writing, I think. But Miranda, do you, do you Miranda's room at the BBC is covered in post-its, and you go in there, and you go, how's it going? And you go, I've got no ideas. Well, <laughs> there they are. Just do that. It's simple, isn't it? Put that one there. 
No, no. not that easy. But, d but do you say to her, stop saying it? Because, of course, one of the sort of criticisms or comments made on, on, on UK sitcoms is that, you know, unlike American ones, we don't, we don't have teams of writers very often, can't afford them, you know. I mean, Steve Moffat seems to be doing okay on his own. But, but other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the sort of drawbacks. Um, do you think that, that's, that that highlights itself in a situation like Miranda sitting there with her graph stressing at home? Or do you think that we get better and more original comedy as a result of it not? being a sort of call. Well, I, I rarely say don't to Miranda, first off. <laughs> um, uh, and I, get, I don't think there are any rules, because the thick of it is team written. But I think the link there is it's, it's led by one person's vision. And I think the, the length of time it takes and the, the um, hardness of, of writing it, it is rewarded, because it is, it is so personal. When it comes on screen, and um, Ricky was saying this, yesterday at another masterclass, you know, comedy has to have some kind of heart, some kind of feeling, otherwise it, it's just noise, it's shash. So I'm afraid you, for the pain it takes writing it, there's usually the gain of, of in this case, Miranda just bearing her soul in the, in the most wonderful way on screen. So yes, I think it's probably a good thing. At what point does it feel to you that it was worth the excruciating agony of the writing? Uh, well, probably in, in pre-production, you know, so, so suddenly starting talking about costumes and set, and you know, bringing it to life, and that I just sort of come to life, and that and that to life, and then um, you know, being in in, in the read-through with the actors and and them enjoying it, and people laughing around the table is just, you know. Also, the clip. I mean, if you if you, if, if that clip had played on, which frankly maybe we should just let it play, but. Um, <laughs> You know, the, and it goes back to the sitcom as well. There was a conceit that the audience didn't know that, the studio audience didn't know that Gary was coming back, correct me if I'm yeah, talking right. bollocks here. But, and, um, and the noise and the response, the live response from the audience as Gary came down the cafe, that surely for, for cast and writers know, must amazing. be electric. And also, series two was going out two as, weeks ahead of as we were recording it. So the audience were coming in, having watched... Uh, an episode of series two for various reasons and that was amazing because it, it felt like a, a semi-live show and that 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 must be no the, huge night, the, the for studio casting. nights it's sort of we we start rehearsing on the wednesday we do a studio on on um the sunday on the wednesday we're all really enjoying ourselves and thinking no this is funny and having great fun thursday we said it too much and we think it's absolute rubbish and we're going with it's unfunny thursday it dark, un oh, that's it unfunny I'm thursday fun, unfunny thursday <laughs> and then hopefully and then funny like, friday. it's gonna be funny friday come on <laughs> and then and then um Sunday, you know, hearing, hearing the response, we were all extraordinarily, extraordinarily mm. nervous because you, you sort of forget that it's funny by then, totally by Sunday. Is there a, is there a dichotomy between appealing to a, the studio audience, which is what happens with BBC sitcoms, and then having to appeal to the TV audience as well? Is there, mm. a, is there a difference in the way you approach those two audiences? Well, I mean, is there a, a worry that what seems like a sort of in-joke in the studio <laughs> and works very well can be completely lost when it's on screen? Yeah, I think it's a really hard. I mean, in the, in the first series, I'd done audience sitcoms before, but some of you guys hadn't. No, and we it were was terrified because also we didn't because, like you say, it was a slightly a different style of sitcom, a more old-fashioned style of sitcom. So you're thinking, oh God, you know, are people? Is this going to be funny? Is it going to work? Is it, you know? And the, the, I remember the first studio we did. Um, I remember you seeing your name on the back of all the flats and I remember you going, oh my God, this is really happening because mm. all the back of the set had Miranda Hart on the back of it and you were going, oh, it. <laughs> and, and the audience reaction was amazing. And then, yeah, you did think, well, maybe it's just these people that like yeah. it and we're getting a false sense of how successful it's going to be. So, And it's hard acting it thinking, oh, I'm, I'm doing it for this audience, it's all about this audience. And then yeah. you go home and you go, oh, my performance was massive. That was a telly show. I forgot it was on telly. It's a telly show. <laughs> Help. You know, so it's a very weird sort of balance. I think by the second series, we kind of, performance-wise, we all Much understood that sort it. of technical side yeah. of it. How much do the, you, do, you talked about sitting down and one of the joys being when you sit down with the, with the other actors and you go through the read-through read and everything. How much does your initial vision change at that point? I mean, I know that, uh, for example, Sarah's part started out very different to, to the different. to the Stevie that we have now in the mm. show. Yeah, and the pilot uh, Stevie was a re-suit. Very and smart. Was and very and sort of wanted to be Alan Sugar's apprentice and was very <laughs> driven. Which Stevie still Stevie still does, does but yeah. in a different way. And then um, I wasn't sort of 
that happy with it. So I, I asked the producer if I could sort of be in a room with Sarah for a couple of days, and um, that sounds wrong. Uh, <laughs> she said, lock her up and tease her <laughs> with a broom um, <laughs> um, to sort of improvise around it, you know. And so uh, um, I can't remember what your question is now, but I'm going to go with it. What about, I'm no, no, about. it's lovely. We're um, all interested. <laughs> yeah, it's still we, too we, early. We, Evolution we, of the we, character. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. We thank tried you. something in and we stood sitting in an office, and I think we went. We took a camcorder back to your flat, and we, and we just imp improvised yeah. around, and then some stuff came out, and then I think I was sort of wandering around your flat, and that's Is that how footage on YouTube by any chance? No. <laughs> no. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but she suddenly she... sung, "What have you done today to make you feel proud?" And I said, "What did you just sing?" And I was just. Because that's something I do do as a person. I would sing something, and then that so became I that. Then it becomes a that. signature, hasn't it? But but now, I think it was such an important shift between pilot and series. Because yeah. I watched the Huge. pilot, and and in the pilot, it's it's the construction is that Miranda is, is in a way is is the lunatic in the asylum, and everyone yeah. else is saying no, Mum, you, and it, but in then in the series, actually, what it's a bit like you know other faulty towers and Dad's army. In a way, Miranda's the sanest of the, the yeah. lot, you know, because. Penny's off, off the map, yeah. you're off the map, and, and Miranda's trying to keep control, which I think is a really important evolution in the show. You, you mentioned the pilot there, and of course you did have a, a nice little period of sort of honing uh, the show, didn't you? Because aside from all the decades, or decades, not decade in <laughs> Edinburgh, <laughs> um, there was also the pilot, then the four shows, I think, for, for, for Radio 2, uh, and then on to television. How important for you was that sort of breathing space where you could look at it and change it and it could evolve as, as a programme. It was Miranda Hart's joke shop on, on radio. Yeah, too, the radio it? thing was good. I mean, it was always a television project first and then uh, we did the pilot and then happened to get four episodes on radio too. So they sort of went sort of together. But um, it was great because I, I mean, I'd never written a sitcom before. Well, how do you write a sitcom? I didn't know how to write a sitcom. Uh, so you're learning on the job. So I was so lucky that I had radio too to, to learn on first and then and before going to telly, it was a great breeding ground. And not a few of the stories um, and jokes stayed, but um, I definitely had a lot of work to do on the stories. I and mean, the sitcom story is just um, hellish. I still find it really difficult. So that, that was really vital for me. And then, and then I did, was doing a series of not going out um, before, doing, before writing my series. So that was also really useful because I had a bit of... I had sort of six months knowing that I had a series before I was writing it. So I just sort of read a lot. I kind of shadowed lots of people on the Not Going Out studio. I learned about the, the genre, and yeah, it was really helpful. I mean, obviously, it's one of the things that the BBC can do, and, and, and I think yours is a sort of uh, a, a, a sign of a, a new progression of, of jobs which are going to sort of straddle across television and radio because. Does it, it does 
it become easier to write for your characters once, once now that you know them well, now that it's an ongoing thing? And I, yeah, I mean, Sarah's a particular good example of that because the Stevie character really was the, the direct was, was rubbish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't very strong. And uh, I mean, people, uh, we met in the audition and then yeah. had this couple of days improvising together. And people would say on the pilot, it must be so nice working your, with your best friend of years. You've clearly known each other years, so we went back last week. So we just <laughs> immediately connected. And now I, I write very much for Sarah, particularly. And, um, and she sometimes comes around and kind of performs something like a monkey and I'm like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and that's really no joke, isn't it? Uh, so Stop it! <laughs> what else <laughs> have <I> do <laughs> yeah. We like sort of two seven-year-old children being on plays for ourselves. <laughs> Stevie was going to be the high status character who <laughs> put me down and, and told me to, you know, uh, grow up and wear better clothes. But that now has become Tilly, and that's much better. So we've got some warmth and a sort of sisterly yeah, friendship. Yeah, much more Tilly. panels, aren't we? Yeah. So we're both on as flawed as she is, and the difference is I just think I'm a bit better, but I'm just as bad. Yeah. And that's it's made it much more. And then the Tilly character can just pop in and be rude, rather than constantly being rude, which would be tiresome. And what about the unashamedly kind of middle classness of it? The revile of middle classes and fear in the sitcom again at the time when we thought that that was not to be stamped upon at the BBC or any other channel. Um, do, 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 do you know, and it's all such fun and jolly hockey sticks and uh, Enid Blyton, you kind of feel is there as an influence in the background. Is that something that, that you feel is very much integral to, to the show and there's no way it could have been any different? Well, I don't, I don't think about being middle class or I'm writing a middle class sitcom or, you know, I, I, I know that I found a sort of that height of middle class phrases and phraseology that my, my mum and her friends uh, are far too funny and so I thought, well, hopefully if I find funny other people will and recognise it. So I kind of put that language in it and that, that heightens it, but, but I, I, you know, I, sh I really shy away from being called a middle class. I don't like the sort of label it comes to, I just think funny is funny. No, I, I but those labels do exist. They do, they do, but I sort of think uh, it's irrelevant really. I, I think you're writing a middle class, if you're writing a middle class sitcom and then the, the hero character would have problems like Calandra would break it down and she needs a new watch. Um, <laughs> and you know, that would be her goal. But my, my, I am middle class and I bring that to it and I bring well, that sort of mother character to it. But my, uh, the goals of the character are universal, you know, they're classless. So, uh, yeah. And how about the 8.30 time slot? Do you ever struggle with that? I mean, a, a chocolate penis, I suppose, is fairly, <laughs> fairly inoffensive, but... It... Well, that was the one, that was the one thing. I, I, um, we had a meeting when um, Janice Hadley said, oh, we want to make, make, uh, move it to 8.30. Um, and I've got one issue, which is, is, is one, one shot of you, which actually was on that clip reel, which never got, never got put out. The, the one where you're holding it up. Holding it up. I thought it was on. Yeah, no, that was never we shot it. It's the one thing. We had this hilarious meeting. I'm sure Janice won't mind me saying. But, um, and uh, she said, well, it's just that the, um, it's just that the penis is, is a little bit um, <coughs> anatomically correct. And I just, that's my one thing. And we just laughed so much. It was a very bizarre meeting. It went hard and I actually went to the director of television Did it? at the time. Oh, I sat in a room. <laughs> and we had to discuss uh, whether whether it, ooh, um, whether whether a, a shot was um, a lip or a sub. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we were shuffling frames. Apparently the email cycles. All of us thinking of all this education. We really believe that this is what we'd be doing. Uh, and, and in the end, I can't remember how it was all, but I think it was tiny. We had to. We reshot that yeah. scene that you saw on that. The other thing that struck me, we, we, we lucked out, I think, because in the pilot there's a pair of um, floppy titties on the back wall. And I reckon, I, I reckon if those had been on the set in series one, it would never have gone in. <laughs> What's the difference between comedy titties?
So, and that's been a really nice respite from it. It's been the weird thing, um, saying to the director, that wasn't fun, was it? That wasn't, that wasn't fun. <laughs> Trying to strip away all that sort of thing and do something very different. So, uh, who knows? I don't know if I can pull it off and do something more natural and, and real. But it, it's, it would be lovely to be able to combine both because I think comedy uh, is tiring and technical and, and, and serious, despite the last we have in the rehearsal room. And I, I don't want to ever lose my joy of it. So by doing something else, I think. Uh, at the beginning of shooting the drama, I was still very down on the thought of starting series three and tired and didn't really have the energy for it. And then about four weeks into doing the drama, how much I was enjoying it, I was like, I can't wait now to do the comedy. I think it's really important for me, anyway. Um, to, to, to try and do both, but it may not work out. I'm we sure shall, it will, see. Miranda. We it's looking see. good at the moment. Um, ladies and gentlemen, surely some questions from you. Um, I'll start with this gentleman here at the front. There's a microphone, so they'll bring it round here. Hi there. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, uh, just, just shout. Sarah, can you tell us a bit about your journey, what you started off doing, how you got to Miranda, what the audition was like? Um, I'd, I'd never met Miranda before the audition. I'd done um, uh, comedy before, but as a, never, you know, a studio sitcom like this before. And um, uh, I remember the audition, there was a big, uh, instantly just feeling completely relaxed with Miranda, so much so that I remember there was a big bowl of sweets that you and the producer Probably. and the director were all eating. <laughs> and I just sort of helped myself, which I would never normally do in an audition. And I think I'd had an argument with some scaffolders outside my house and consequently had left my script at home. So I think I sort of bowled in going, I can't believe the morning I've had, and just went into this thing, which I would never normally have done. And I just instantly felt, yeah, I don't I know, know, it I just felt we don't really natural immediately. And it was quite weird, really, because just like Miranda said, we often get asked, have we known each other for a long time? And we just met at the audition. But you've, you've done Mitchell and Webb and Moving Wallpaper and lots of single camera shows. Yeah. Just, so it was you know. <laughs> <laughs> Being your mother. You did have qualifications. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but, um, yeah, so it was very... And I just remember it, like you say, the first series being very nervous about this because it, se it seemed like a very old-fashioned style of sitcom, and I was just thinking, oh, God, I remember all the... Well, slapstick. we had a very honest conversation with you saying, can I sort of make this more natural and put ums and so's in it? And I... Um, well, now I'm just going, no. Um, <laughs> and then we were more polite with each other. But uh, they sort of all went... All the actors who sort of did make it more natural, they all went in the edit because it had to be that sort of rhythm that now in series two we sort of get... I think we're more confident and more trusting yeah, now that it, that it works and that, yeah, it's just... The lady there <laughs> in the in the middle row. Hi. Um, with respect to the physical gags, do you come up with these as your just one minute. Can I just can you all hear or do you need could could we use the microphone? It's just Otherwise, half the audience can't hear. Sorry. Do you mind repeating that question? Thanks sure. a lot. Um, I'm just curious to how you come up with the, the more physical elements of the gags in the show. And um, if it's a question of when you're constructing the storyline, things come to you, or if you have certain things that you think, you know, running down the road after a taxi in your pants is brilliant, and it's a question of, you know, trying to slot it in somewhere. Um, I think it's a bit of, bit of both, really. Like the uh, falling in the grave was uh, I had that on a post-it note somewhere, you know, falling in a grave, uh, after the line, I wish the ground could have swallowed me up, um, to put it into, you know, context. Um, uh, so I had that somewhere, and then, but I didn't deliberately write a scene around a funeral for that gag, but then when the funeral thing idea came, I was like, oh, great, those two now. I, I then have to do that gag in a cemetery, so, you know, so, so uh, all things like the taxi uh, was, for me, it's just a gag, it's not really a physical gag, so I was thinking, oh, I need a flashback at that point in the story about things always going wrong with Gary. So I was just, uh, I remember walking along the towpath with my dog, actually, I can remember specifically when I thought about it, I was saying, I need a gag, what could go wrong, what could I have said in a pub or bar, and then I thought of that. So, yeah, it's, it's just a sort of different way of writing, I suppose, it being physical. But, um, yeah, I think the, fir the first series, I sort of just happily fell over boxes in rehearsal room at any given point. I would just fall over again. Great. That would be funny. <laughs> and now I'm a bit more prescriptive about it and only do one um, big fall per um, episode and make sure, it's <laughs> make sure it's in a context and is going to be surprising. And so I don't know what I'm going to do for series three. So hang off a crane and <laughs> set the dock. Yeah, so Something life-endangering, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So it sort of varies. 
Uh, there's a, a lady there, and then I'll come to you, sir. Hi, can you please tell us about your comedy graph? Comedy graph? <laughs> oh, yeah, the comedy graph. Uh, well, it, it's, it, <laughs> it's just, um, a, once I've storylined an episode, it's just a way for me to make sure and feel happy about the ups and downs in the story and whether a big laugh. So, for, for example, um, series one, um, no, a, a episode one, series two, which was the clip we just saw about the, the farting scene, um, I would, I would have a, my graph and I would say, right, she's, in this episode she's starting in a very low point, she's very down, um, so then, uh, and then she decides to be the new her, so that'll be, that'll be a positive and a hopeful thing. Now if we're up here, something bad's got to happen, so the sushi restaurant, she's on the conveyor belt, good, that's a down, but that's a big laugh. And then it'll potter along there for a bit, feeling low, but bumbling along. And then suddenly, oh, she gets a date with the guy. Good, that's up. And then Penny, her mother, ruins the date. We're down again. So then, you know, I'll just sort of plot it in, in what, it, what the plot is. I'll plot it like that. And so I actually draw it, and then I look at it and go, oh, that, there's a bit too long. There's sort of probably four minutes there where there hasn't been a little spike or a little something. So it just shows that there's you know, kind of light and shade to it and a rhythm to it and that there's always something happening because I can't bear... Uh, for me, in every scene, something's got to happen. Do you have an optimum number of peaks per show? Um, but they're all, they're all very different. Some will sort of be along like that and then a little down and some will be like that and then like that and then some will be like that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, here, at the back. Here. Uh, how easy was it to find the other actors? Were they obvious to you when you wrote the characters that you would have Patricia Hodges as the mum? And it was actually the radio producer who did the, the Radio 2 shows who suggested Patricia Hodge. And, um, and like I suppose a lot of people who saw her in the show said, well, that's interesting because she was not necessarily known for comedy. She'd done a lot of comedy in theatre but not on television. And she was just a revelation the minute she read it. It was just... That, so I really thank Dawn Ellis, the producer, who thought of that. And then um, Tom Ellis I'd met a few times, who plays Gary, and thought um, he, he's a nice-looking chap. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was brilliant as well. He's just, he's just great. He's got great sense of timing, and his sort of looks really sort of... Yeah, he's great. And, um, and Sally Phillips, well, you know, I, I would always have wanted... I didn't write with her particularly in mind, but when she was suggested, I thought, well, perfect. So it was a bit of both, a bit of auditioning and a bit of me thinking of people. We've got time for a couple more questions, uh, or three, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start there and I'll just work across and then we'll probably have to come to a, a conclusion. Um, was there ever any discussion about using your own name in the title for the character? Um, well, it was, always, it was always my idea to use, uh, to use my my name, and I always wanted that, because I wanted that sort of... Uh, it was sort of harking back to that kind of light entertainment feel that you're a persona in a, in a sitcom, or... Um, sort of Ellen, I suppose, was a big inspiration. So I liked that sort of... that the audience might think it's semi-autobiographical autobiographical feel, but it was certainly not my idea to call it Miranda. Yeah. That was a big discussion with the producers who... It was the producer's idea. I was like, I can't. Oh my God, that was just way too much pressure. Um, I just felt sick about it. But now I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. But I was just too close to it, and it's obviously it's me, it's my, it's my name. I just was imagining reviews more than anything else. It was just fear. But I, it's absolutely the right thing to do for the show. But, yes. Can I ask you, you talk about right, being inspired by universal themes, like feeling awkward, but now that you're such a success and that you must know that everybody loves you, do you still feel awkward and do you still have those themes to be inspired by? Um, well, I'm much less awkward than, than she is. <laughs> 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 to, make that, yeah. to be fair. All right, but... <laughs> but, but uh, well, I, I, I thank you for saying about the success. I, can't, I, I think uh, I, I find that hard to take on. I haven't sort of... I know a lot of people, maybe it's a female thing, I don't know, a lot of people sort of go, oh, I'm... I'm Oh, I'm, I'm famous. I'm th I can sit with that. I'll put my shoulders back, and I think it's given me a bit of confidence. But uh, I haven't taken it on, on board. It's just the same old me, and I, I still get surprised. You know, when people stop me in the street. I kind of oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm on television. I forget. I haven't really taken it 
hasn't sort of sat. I think you did say somewhere about it giving you the confidence to tackle bigger issues and themes. Was that right? What, in the sitcom or the, 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 the success of the shows, uh, and I wondered, in fact, one of the things I was going to ask you was whether you thought that that might influence the, the show in the future. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I still feel, I don't feel any different, really. I still feel just as, yeah, that those themes will come quite naturally. I mean, I mean the show being a success gives me an enormous confidence in terms of uh, writing for the characters. That it's just wonderful to be on series three and going, well, I know then such fun will get a laugh at that point. I never thought the phrase such fun will get a laugh. So, yeah, it does. Uh, the, the writing process has given me enormous confidence, mm. yeah. This gentleman here, and then I think we're going to have to conclude. Hi there. It may be a bit too much like a comic release sketch, but how do you think uh, Miranda and Stevie would fare if Patsy and Adina came to the shop? <laughs> oh, God, wow. Very good Stevie idea. Stevie probably have a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> wow, comet relief, 2000 and whenever, here we come. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 2013. 13, 13. Yeah. 13. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, we just... Uh, well, we should copyright well, it, they definitely. Would, they would give us a glass of champagne and on one we'd be pissed and going... <laughs> 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 That's the yeah. obvious route, I suppose. <laughs> Just re yeah, just two really quite square suburban <laughs> women versus these going, look at that chocolate willies, and then just going, <laughs> freaks, yeah. It's hard to imagine what would have them yeah. trawling a joke shop. But, uh, In my mind, Jennifer Saunders plays Sally Phillips' mother when I'm writing it. Oh, really? I don't know if I told you that, could, but there you Patsy go. Patsy be um, Stevie's mum. Patsy could be Stevie's yes. mum. And uh, <laughs> Jennifer could be Tilly's mum. I think this has got legs. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Off. I think Mark will be talking to you about it later. <laughs> uh, Mark Freeland, Sarah Hadland, and Miranda Hart. Thank you. Thank you.